This is an Audi all-road. It is the second worst car ever manufactured in the entire history of the automobile. It's only second worst because of this, a 2002, I don't know, Kia Spectra, which is truly the worst car in the history of the automobile. And today, I'm going to put both of these cars out of their misery by running them over with this, my Land Rover Defender. Now, before we get started here, let's discuss what exactly made these cars so bad, starting with the all-road. Now, back in 2003, when this thing was new, this car had everything. It started at $41,000, which almost $50,000 today. It had leather upholstery. It had memory settings for the interior. It had a power sunroof. It had heated rear seats. It had dual-zone automatic climate control. And yet, it was horrible. The first problem with the all-road is up here, the engine. Now, most of the all-roads used a 2.7-liter twin-turbocharged V6, which sounds really cool, except that the way it was designed, you had to remove basically the entire front of the car in order to change the timing belt. Also, the turbochargers were constantly failing, requiring thousands of dollars to fix. German engineering. Next up, the transmission. Audi's wonderful Tiptronic couldn't handle the all-road's massive 250 horsepower, and so the Tiptronic failure rate in these cars is 100%, requiring thousands of dollars to replace the transmission, which will fail again later. German engineering. Next up, the suspension. Audi couldn't figure out that the market wanted SUVs, so they made this, a wagon that could raise up with the push of a button thanks to the air suspension. Unfortunately, Audi couldn't figure out how to make air suspension, so the air suspension constantly failed, requiring thousands of dollars in expensive repairs to fix. German engineering. This particular all-road also had another problem. Does this car have a green interior? And the seats are green. The door panels are green. The dashboard, the A pillars, and the, the headliner is green. It's kind of green interior, doesn't it? So your shirt. My shirt's gray. And green. This is heinous! The Kia, meanwhile, belongs to my friend Filippo. You may remember this car because I created a video about it last year. There's this dent. There's this dent. There's this scrape. And this scrape. This car is so bad that Filippo one time went on the Edmunds.com trade-in value tool to see what it was worth, and he put in all the specifics, and the trade-in value was... Negative $39. Negative $39. Rather than accept that generous payout of negative $39, Filippo abandoned this Kia on the street in West Philadelphia a year ago with the key inside and the door unlocked. It was still sitting there a couple of weeks ago after a year, admittedly with the windshield bashed in, when we decided that it was time to do something useful with it, namely crush it with my Defender. And now, with that out of the way, I'm going to tow the Kia over to where the all-road is. I've hooked up my tow strap. Time to do it. Well, that's a, that's a shame, really. Now, before I crush these two cars, I've decided to put them through a series of highly technical, thorough scientific tests. For example, I've always kind of wondered what would happen if you hooked a tow strap up to a car's steering wheel and then tried to pull it. So today, figure, why not find out? And so, with the tow strap fastened to the steering wheel, I backed my Range Rover into place. And then I went for it. Initially, it seemed like nothing much had happened, but on closer investigation of the steering wheel, look at this. Steering wheels are insanely tough, and this isn't easy to do, but now this one had a hole in it. In fact, it seemed like the entire steering column had been destroyed by the force of this pull. Then it was time for the next scientific test. Next up, we're going to try to see what happens when we hook the tow strap onto the roof rack. Here goes. And so, I secured the tow strap to the roof rack, I backed into place, and... Not surprisingly, the roof rack gave way, but it held its ground longer than I expected. So long, the car actually moved from where it had been towed. But the scientific tests weren't over yet. So now, we've tried a different method. I've wrapped the tow strap around the B-pillar, and I'm going to pull it from here. Let's see what happens. Once again, I secured the tow strap, I backed into place, and I began the test. And just in case you want to see that again from another angle, because I know you do, here you go. Well, 
this is a good angle in case you've ever wanted to see what the underside of an Audi all-road looks like. But if you want a better look, here you go. There's a lot of leaked oil under there. Sounds like all-road ownership. All right, now that we've flipped the all-road over and we've sufficiently stood around for a while and stared at it, we're now going to flip it back over using the only method that I know how. <laughs> the toe strap. And so, once again, I got back into place and once again, I accelerated forward. And the all-road was back. All right, a little post-mortem of the all-road here now that it's been rolled back over and a lot of stuff has been done to it. You know, I've been making fun of German engineering in con context of this car, but I have to admit, look at this. This thing has been on its roof and all the doors still open. This panel is, is buckled a little bit. The hatch opens, that's pretty good. On this side, there's some stuff on the ground. The front has been compressed a little bit, no surprise, but it hasn't impacted the passenger compartment. I mean, you could still be sitting in there and you'd be fine. If anybody's looking for a front passenger all-road floor mat, green, you know, here you go. I'm really surprised at the lack of cabin intrusion with the car into the interior here. Uh, legitimately, we could have had someone, if they'd been really strapped in, we could have had someone sitting in here and they would have been totally fine. It's really kind of impressive how well they've, the car has done. Now, before I go any further, one quick point. When I posted images from this event on my Facebook and Instagram pages, some people got angry that I destroyed a perfectly good running all-road. When I say some people, I mean used Volkswagen and Audi enthusiasts who are the most sensitive, delicate people in the history of wheeled transportation. Really, this all-road had major engine issues and it had it run for almost two years, so the owner was using it for parts and he was selling it to the crusher anyway. But this seemed like a more fun way to go. The owner had already ripped out the stereo and the climate controls and he removed the suspension to use in another all-road, so this one was towed in on wood blocks, meaning it couldn't even roll. In other words, it had major problems, just like every all-road. But you could sell the parts, the VW Audi contingent might say. Yeah, I have one parking space at my house. I don't have the ability to park a junk all-road back there and pull off used parts as I get requests from Volkswagen Audi people who will inevitably offer to trade me vape supplies. Plus, if you want an all-road parts car, it isn't that hard to find one. By now, I would reckon most first-generation all-roads are parts cars. Oh, and one more thing. I've got a whole write-up about this whole car crushing experience. If you click the link below to go to autotrader.com slash oversteer. With that in mind, on to the next test. Next up, I've always wondered what happens if you slash the tires with a giant knife. So, let's find out. <laughs> wow. That, I guess. Interestingly, the tire slashing was functional. I needed to slash the front tires to lower the Kia and the Audi in order to make it easier for the Defender to climb up. So... Last one, poor Kia. <laughs> and then it was time for the final test. All right, our next test, we have a nice sledgehammer, which is important when you're doing automobile testing. And uh, David here, my friend David, he owns Automobili Limited, the place where we're doing all this. This is my friend Filippo, and we are gonna see who can hit the largest dent with the sledgehammer into the side of the all road. You guys ready? Yeah, let's ready. do it. All right. David took the sledgehammer first. All right, you get one shot because we want one dent from each person, so you only have one try. You ready? All right, bring it on. <laughs> Very good. Well done. Filippo was up next with the sledgehammer. All right, you ready? Yeah. It is. So you get only one shot again. Yeah. Ready? Okay. That was pretty good. These are pretty, these are fairly similar. Then it was my turn. All right, now it's my turn, but I have a secret weapon. I'm not gonna use the sledgehammer. I'm gonna use my car. <laughs> All right, the test to see who can dent the car most is completed. This is Filippo's dent. This is David's dent. And here is my giant dent. I win. And now, on to the next thing. The next thing was the actual crush itself. So I set down some ramps I had bought for this special occasion and I readied the Defender. And then, I went for it. The Defender made it up. Let's see that from another angle.
was great, but there was a problem. The Defender kicked out the ramp, so the back wheels couldn't get up. I had it in low range, but I couldn't figure out how to get on the diff lock, so that just kept happening. It already looked cool with just two wheels on the Kia and the Audi, but I wanted to get all four wheels up if we could. We decided the ramps simply weren't cutting it, and we found another solution, cinder blocks. With the blocks in place as a sort of stair step to getting on the all-road, I tried it one last time. The Defender made it, and since you've come this far in this video, you should probably see it from a few other angles. And so, ladies and gentlemen, the Defender is a hero. It has rid the world of the unreliability and the general awfulness of the all-road in the Kia. Nice going, buddy. After a few minutes and a lot of pictures, I backed the Defender up down the Kia and the all-road very carefully, and the crush was complete. It was back on solid ground, and the Kia and the all-road would be hauled off the next day to the salvage yard. On the way home, I noticed the Defender's air conditioning wasn't working. Maybe the all-road's unreliability was contagious.